Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this technical webcast um, presented by Civil Survey Solutions for Alignment Best Practice. My name is Jonathan Taylor. I'm the Technical Marketing Manager for Civil, Sur Sur Civil Survey Solutions. That's a good start. Um, and I'm uh, coming to you live from Sydney. We've also got Terry, who's going to be your presenter today. Uh, Terry, you're based in Perth. How are you going? Good, thank you. Welcome, how's everybody. The, how's the weather in, uh, in WA? Sunny and gorgeous, uh, as is. expected. Of yeah, it is. yeah, all right, rub it in. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'll come back to you, Terry, uh, in, in a short while. Just a quick little bit of housekeeping in regards to this presentation today. Um, as per usual, all of these webcasts are recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel normally within 24 hours. We will mention the YouTube channel at the very end on a final kind of book ending slide um, to make sure um, if you guys aren't too sure whereabouts it is, um, that will be discussed. Um, any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A panel that is found on the screen in front of you. Um, please avoid using the chat because the chat is very difficult to log and manage um, because it opens up lots of windows at our end, um, whereas the Q&A is all nice and concise. So if you can use that, Please, for any questions that are relevant to the webcast, particularly obviously towards what Terry is showing, and any questions that we can't answer, we'll endeavor to answer um, maybe at the end, or if we can duck in and interrupt Terry at an appropriate moment, we will do so. Um, really, I think that is it. Ah, just one other thing. Uh, the screen in front of you, if, if you double click um, the screen in front of you, it will um, reduce the size of the screen, and then if you double click, it will go full screen. We've had the odd question here and there over the um, uh, past few months as to how they can people can manage the, the, the screen. So if you need to uh, adjust what you're seeing, you can just double click. Right, well, let, uh, look, I'll hand over to you, Terry. So Terry is uh, our application engineer, and as we already discussed, he's based in Perth in WA. Um, he's got extensive background with local government and um, certainly uh, has been on the receiving end of uh, lots of questions in respect of uh, training. So I think, uh, Terry, a lot of what you're doing today has been born out of um, customer experience. Would that be correct? Absolutely. So uh, some of the examples I'll be showing, um, uh, some people can uh, put their hand up and say, yes, I've done that. Um, not all of them are necessarily um, mistakes, but uh, just different ways of doing the same thing and uh, pros and cons of, of the different methods. And um, yeah, absolutely via tickets um, and also via uh, training. Uh, a lot of these issues are very common for users. Great. So unless there's any more housekeeping, I might kick off. Go for it, yeah. Sweet, so um, this is my uh, lovely mug here when I was skiing in New Zealand. Uh, pay no attention to, uh, to how much fun I'm having and can't have at the moment. Um, as we step through the slideshow, uh, we can see here that uh, when transitioning from a survey to a design, uh, users have to appreciate what the survey uh, has given them uh, and the, I guess appreciate the challenges of getting the data, uh, what's actually involved in, in delivering and what they've received, as well as uh, what they intend to do with it um, and what the alignment, the intent of the alignments that they're going to be creating will be. Uh, so if it's a, in a different scenario, you might treat it differently as to how you create the alignment from the points. Uh, and so what is the intent of the, uh, of the alignment? You would make that decision um, as a designer and then you would choose the most appropriate method uh, to create your alignments. Uh, there's a few different options. <coughs> Considering the best fit tools from Civil 3D. Uh, most importantly, we want to ensure that there is uh, tangency uh, if that is the intent to it, uh, avoid bow ties, um, we're going to discuss what a bow tie is in more depth when we go through some of the examples. And um, CAD drafting, for those uh, users who are not um, on the Civil 3D platform and don't have uh, access to their best fit tools, uh, you'll be using these CAD drafting options to create your alignments. Uh, and so I've got a few tips for, the, for those users as well. Okay, the next slide, we're going to uh, run through our workflow. So we're going to um, look at a survey. Uh, I've got a data set here, the one that we use for our training, and a lot of you will be familiar with it from other um, webinars. Uh, so we're going to review a survey. We're going to familiarise ourselves with the site. And in particular, what I want to demonstrate is uh, an existing uh, street that was surveyed, um, which has a variety of um, complexity to it. So, um, and that... This helps me to highlight some of the uh, nuances with what the, what the surveyors face on site. 
uh, and how that translates into what you get in the office. Uh, and that will contribute to um, what data you've got and how you, and how, and how you use it. Uh, I always, always, when I was designing, always put an aerial photo, if it was available, behind my uh, design because there's, it's quick and easy and the information uh, that it provides, whilst static, is, um, is, is quite uh, advantageous. Um, surveyors are humans and can miss a feature or um, as, a, as a designer, you might inadvertently turn layers off for clarity and uh, hide from yourself uh, some site features. The aerial photo can be faded in the background and is quite a handy tool. Um, and it's like an analog version of a digital representation. So you'll see colors and shades and, and it gives a lot of information, um, which is quite handy. Uh, and a lot of bang for your buck in my opinion. Uh, in the identifying the intent of the alignments, uh, we'll go through some of that um, in the examples. Then we'll select the appropriate alignment creation method. I'll show you a, a few different options there. And then finally Q and at the end where JT can uh, uh, sam uh, field some of your questions or, or send through some of those questions through to me. In the alignment creation methods, there's, uh, there's going to be a few different ones that I show you. Uh, they include uh, drafting in CAD. So for um, those of you using Civil 3D, you'll be able to uh, draft your alignments in CAD and then just uh, create an alignment from objects. This is the way I used to use the most, and it's uh, probably the easiest way, in my opinion. Uh, so most users uh, will be familiar with that method. Uh, you can also use the best fit tool in Civil 3D, uh, and I'll show you some of the pros and cons of using that. Uh, I'm going to uh, use a different version of the um, best fit where we're going to use the best fit tools um, as components in a, an alignment. And also um, a method which kind of triggered this webinar um, is using the uh, central line straight from the civil 3D, or sorry, straight from the 3D polylines from the survey uh, and why that may or may not be a good idea. Okay. So without further ado, let's kick off. Uh, first thing I wanted to show you was um, the challenges in surveying. So when you're surveying a road, this is uh, the Molly Mook data set that we do a lot of our training on. Uh, I've deliberately turned on all the points. You'll notice that there, there's a combination of data in here. This has got uh, point cloud data as well as um, it's combined with feature survey data. So the points uh, have brake lines uh, for curbs and centre lines, etc. So I'm just going to pan up and uh, I guess familiarise uh, you guys with this site. So you can see we've got some curb and then these are just some uh, edge of bitumen lines. You can see there's a bit of a step out in here and uh, quite a complex uh, scenario. Um, one, what I want to draw your attention to here is that the centre line or the, well, the centre line that's been surveyed is not in the centre of the road. Uh, and so I'm going to be discussing that. Uh, if I zoom in, you can see based on your photo, we've got some line marking in there as well. So that can also contribute to the decision of the surveyor to pick up that line because it's quite relevant, obviously, to the designer. Um, however, if it's not the crown of the road, the line marking, whilst it's nice to be able to place it in the drawing, is not um, necessarily helpful for the slope of the road. It has no um, relevance in the Z dimension. So when you're actually designing your crown, if the uh, centre of the road is offset, which is not ideal in a design scenario, but does happen in, in, out in the world. So if the surveyor picks up the crown of the road uh, in the middle, if that was where it was, and the line marking is off to the side, um, then you would probably want to inspect two lines there. And if he hasn't done that, then you might want to just uh, hit him up to get, it, to get that centre line. Um, with that said, I am just going to bring over... <clears throat> the Google Maps version of this. So this is the Molly Mook site. Uh, so it's uh, probably halfway through the subdivision. And so I'm just going to drag in the Google Street View and we're just going to drop in and have a look at the site. So you can see the original survey was of uh, Illet Street and you've got this uh, jagged edge and a nice smooth edge on, on the other side. So you've got a a variety of options here. This is quite typical. We've got like a, let's just say a crown shape and a centre line which matches the line marking and also the approximate geometric centre of the road. So this is probably most common and very easy scenario to survey. 
Uh, as we step up though, you'll see that uh, the scenario changes uh, where we've got this step out in the asphalt where there's been some overlay and some reconstruction and uh, in the past there's been some work, still a jagged edge, uh, but uh, clearly wider than the original road. So the, and I'm using my air quotes here that no one can see, the centre line of the road is no longer technically the centre of the road. Uh, so they've continued to pick up the crown and the line marking, but it's not uh, the geometric centre of the road. And as we go up the hill, you'll see that they've uh, done some formalised the widening and put some curb in to, uh, looks like to formalise the parallel parking on the side of the road. Um, and so you can see uh, that the road uh, goes up and there's not necessarily a crown shade. It's kind of hard to see through the lens of the uh, Google camera, but uh, basically for a designer, I would recommend um, if you don't have access to the site, certainly have a look on the street view as I am now. Um, but if you can afford, avail yourself to the site, get there and have a look and appreciate what the road is doing for yourself in person. And the things you should be looking for is uh, where is the crown of the road? Where's the water going to drain? Is my centre line that I'm going to design following the crown? Because having a lane straddle the crown is uh, certainly a no-no um, and feels quite strange if you've ever driven on a highway and had to cross over to the other side of the road to overtake a car or, or something like that. You'll feel your steering behave differently as you straddle the crown um, because it very rarely happens most people are, are un, it's unexpected uh, sensation for a driver so uh, it's just ideal to have if you can to have the, the crown of the road follow the lane uh, separation not necessarily the center of the road um, but certainly if you've got multiple lanes uh, have the changing grade uh, for the crown occur as much as you can outside of the lane Okay, so the surveyor's come up here and he's kept on uh, collecting this. Now, just one more thing on the challenges of surveying. You can see here it's, uh, it's on a crest and uh, we've got double barrier lines to protect motorists from each other. Uh, but as a surveyor, you've got to walk out here and try and uh, put your high vis on and, um, and collect some data for the design team. So you'll be walking out. Now, safest place obviously is down this uh, line marking because the cars can pass on either side. But if the road was crowned in the middle, as if, as if this road was reconstructed, and crowned in the middle, then you'd be coming up and coming down. So the surveyor needs to pick up shots out here in the lane. So uh, that would also be quite uh, dangerous and quite a challenge. And probably um, in this scenario, probably require some traffic management. So uh, I guess um, a little bit of a hat tip to challenges of, of uh, surveying, but also as a designer, the data that you get, um, you need to be mindful that uh, uh, the crown of the road is not necessarily the center or the line marks, uh, center of the lanes. All right, so if I go back to the view, you can see where that steps out. This has all been constructed in the, uh, in the aerial photo. So I'm just gonna move that out of the way. As we come to our, uh, back to our project here, you can see how that data steps out here for the uh, edge of bitumen and then comes out and then our curb starts and it continues over the crest and, uh, and continues on down the road. So I want to show you that jagged edge in plan, how the survey centre line does not follow the geometric centre of the road. And before you go uh, down the hall and tell the Savar off, that's probably because this is the crown road before it was widened. So hence the, uh, hence the offset. Uh, as we design, um, we're given a centre line and this is a 3D polyline underneath the alignment that I've made. So I've got uh, a polar line which I've flattened to turn into a um, into a uh, into an alignment. Uh, you do have a 3D poly line. Oh, and I do want to just um, touch on the tools that I'm using as well. Uh, and please forgive me if you're a veteran user and you're very comfortable with using AutoCAD, but I will occasionally um, sidetrack onto uh, the tools that I use because not everyone um, uses the tools the same way. And what we want to do is include all of the new users who are unfamiliar with some of the things that I'm doing. So when I click on this, um, this alignment or this line, bunch of lines here, you'll see that I've got the square on square uh, little icon up here. Uh, and when I click on the uh, option, I get a list and uh, this is what's called selection cycling. Selection cycling is activated or, or disabled down here. And we've got the three lines on the right, uh, which will have selection cycling uh, visible. And I've got that ticked on. This tick only activates the button or reveals the button. It doesn't actually activate the tool. So we tick on uh, selection cycling, it reveals the tool, and then I can toggle on and off the tool uh, here in the view. So I'm using selection cycling. 
uh, and that's how I'm able to bring up this uh, this form. So that's just a little tip for new users. And uh, yeah, so I select my 3D polyline. And so this is what you might get uh, from a survey where it's got um, the Z values in 3D. And if I click on the vertices, I can step through the vertices and you'll see the Z value change and the marker step up. Uh, and the other thing that I can do if I've selected the 3D polyline, uh, it looks very similar to a um, to other line features. I can hover my mouse over the grip and keep your eye on the Z value here. It magnets to the grip, so it uh, then gives me the Z value. So I don't actually need to inquire each point and step through properties and that. I can just hover over and very quickly get a, a reading of the Z value. Um, so also because this is a 3D polyline, it's showing uh, no interim grips. Uh, and so that's another another tell that it's a 3D polyline as opposed to when I select the polyline, which is in 2D, you'll see it's got these rectangular groups. And when I select, uh, if it was just a line, let's draw one off to the side. So if I just type line, <coughs> you'll see that lines have a square grip. So just little tells that uh, let you know what's in 3D and what's in in 2D and how it's been put together. Okay, so from this information, uh, we've got these centre line shots. These are just AutoCAD points for now, all the way up. Uh, and so what I've done for our convenience, uh, rather than doing the same thing over and over again on top of the same layer, is I've just copied those out and these are just the AutoCAD points of the same centre line, and I've just brought those out and we can do some examples on those. So those are just uh, AutoCAD points, so there's nothing unique about these. All right, so the first option I wanted to show for creating an alignment. Uh, now you'll notice this one has a bit of a kink at the bottom and a, and a bend at the top, so nothing too amazing, um, but just uh, some, some deviation uh, for us to use uh, in our examples. So the first tool we'll look at is in the uh, Civil 3D tools, we'll show the best fit. Uh, so in the alignment tools, uh, this is just uh, the full on uh, create alignment from best fit uh, option. I will be showing another option with more functionality later on. Okay, so in here I select uh, the AutoCAD points and I can select those. I'm going to select them in this order. So I've got my points. Uh, I'm not interested in using spirals. Uh, I'm going to call this one uh, best fit demo. Uh, not interested in the site. The layer's fine. I don't. I will show the report, but I won't show the labels. So I click OK on that, and it brings up this uh, report. Um, I can step through here and see the different uh, points and the offset that it's given me. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much editing in here. It's just a report. Uh, and you can see the align and the, basically the variation off to each side and how that's been created. So I can close that. And it gives me um, an alignment of best fit. So I'll just scroll up and you can see where the points occur and the relative uh, automated location of the, of the best fit alignment from Civil 3D. The other thing that I'll point out is the direction. So it's given me a... Uh, from north to, to north to south, uh, southbound uh, alignment. Uh, this was covered in um, other web sessions, but I'll just uh, click on that and I come to the modify and I can reverse the direction uh, in here. Now, I want to focus on this for a bit. Civil 3D warns me quite severely here that I'm about to change the direction, um, changing the direction of an alignment or adjusting the start particularly of an alignment can be detrimental to a design. At this stage, there's no harm because there's nothing relying on it. But because the uh, alignment is basically the spline of your design, everything is measured from that. You start with an alignment and then you apply Z values and then you create a surface uh, and so on and so on. Uh, Civil 3D users will use them to make um, their corridors and so on, surfaces and then reports and, and it all grows from there. So it's basically one of the initial features. And if you get it wrong and have to flip it around or adjust the start, it really does. Um, have a knock-on effect, which some of you may have experienced and, and come to through the day that you've had to move an alignment. Okay, so uh, definitely want to get it right the first time, so that's why we're sort of focusing uh, on this webinar. 
Okay, so what we've got, it's made a little uh, portion in here. It's applied some bends um, and you can see that there's some separation. Even at the start, there's some separation uh, because it's automating the, uh, the uh, process. Some of the points on the left, some of the points on the right, uh, and then applies another bend. And again, it's, uh, it's not uh, tying in at the end where you may want it to if you're at the start and end of your design where you want to actually tie into the existing center line. Okay, so there's other methods uh, that are push, uh, that use like a combination uh, in the uh, alignment creation tools. So I'm just gonna choose that option here. Some room. Okay, so this one I'm going to say is uh, the, we'll call it the partial. Uh, best fit. All right, so same as before, I'm just going to create that alignment. And with my alignment creation tools, we'll start with just an arc. So I want a fixed curve three point arc. So we get a starting point and then I want to do a best fit uh, line. So we'll come up to here, fixed line, best fit. Uh, we're going to go from the AutoCAD points and click OK. Uh, and so it's asking me to select the AutoCAD points. So I can come up and I don't want to go all the way up to the end because I'm going to apply a curve up there. So I'm just going to come through to here and select the points that I want to include in my best fit. You can see those listed here. And it brings up the panorama. So this is all of the points um, that I've got selected. And you can see here as I step through, they can be highlighted. And at the bottom here, we've also got the, uh, as before, with the automated uh, best fit tool, it's got this deviation from the, uh, from the um, approximated uh, line that it's applying. And what I can also do, what's uh, good about this one is that if I wanted this line to um, start exactly on that point, I can actually nominate a pass through uh, option and I can control at, the, at least at the start and the end if that's my choice. And at the end here, I can just scroll down to the bottom and I can apply a pass through there. And so what that does is it forces the line to match into those two. Um, obviously, if I do that, then I'm pretty much null and voiding all of the other elements uh, so what I would what I could also do is apply weighting to those if I want the start and end to be closer to those points I can apply a weight uh, different to the other points so they're not all treated equally uh, and so that's uh, that option there and I can tick on that and then the next one I want to do is the arc uh, best fit as well again I'll go with the autocad points and I can just select these points. Where's that one? And same as before. If you want to access that form again, because there's a bit of disconnect in here, so you might want to uh, snap that to pass through and have a common point. It's probably worth having that on a turning point as well, because it's likely to be a set out point for your uh, end of your design. And you can access that form again through here, uh, just uh, toggle that form on and off. And so you can access that as well. The next option, as I scroll through my uh, list, was to draft these in CAD. Now, if, you're, if you don't have Civil 3D, then you're going to uh, have to use these CAD options because you won't have access to the best fit tools. So uh, what you can do here, so I'll just start off um, drafting in CAD. So I'm just going to type A for ARC. And I've got all of my snaps on. I'm going to talk about my snaps a bit later as well, what I'm using uh, and why it's relevant to this process. Uh, and what we want to do is create uh, an arc. And I've just used three points. So I've just clicked onto those three points. But if I draw a line now, L for line, uh, and come up now, I can choose a point which is, if I just do it by eye, then I'm going to have some rough uh, points here and there and if I continue through with my arc, uh, I can use three points for the rest of it. 
and continue like this, there's going to be issues. Uh, and so this way might not necessarily be uh, preferable for you. I uh, can just drag that one to there and you could approximate it. Yeah, that will probably be a straight portion at the end of the roundabout. So the reason why this is a bad idea is because you don't have the accuracy. You've also got zero tangency. Like everything is independent of the other. Um, also, because I'm snapping to these uh, points which are in 3D, uh, each one of these uh, elements will have a Z value, uh, have its own Z value, depending on where I started it from. And so what I'm going to do, or what I could do here in the drafting option, is I'll just remove those. So what we want to do is uh, we'll go for an arc in here. Three point arc. And what we want to do is uh, create a tangent between these two to maintain our tangency. So we've drafted this as a three point uh, curve and we've drafted the other end as a three point curve. And I want to maintain some tangency through there. Um, for this example, actually, I might uh, choose a more convincing arc at the top. I think there's better bend. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about my snaps in here as well. So what I want to do is draw a line. I'm using alpha line, not polyline. Um, interesting is uh, thing to note is that polylines are always uh, planar, they're always flat. Lines can be in three dimensions. So, so I snap on this one. Uh, what I want is a tangent between this arc and this arc. Uh, and so it uh, can be quite challenging. You can just type tan and it gives you a tentative snap. You see it's got the uh, tangent icon for my snap, but the three dots. So if I click on that, as I move my mouse around, it maintains tangency. So wherever I click next, we'll be uh, creating a line which is tangent to that arc. At the other end, I'll do the same thing. If I type tan up here, it's possible that it won't be able, you can see here, it won't be able to do it because this doesn't quite turn enough, right? So it doesn't establish enough arc uh, to exaggerate that. Um, so you can see what it's at, what's actually happening is one arc comes in like this and the other one comes in like that. But there's no, this one turns enough. And so there's a tangent here, but there's not enough bend to create a tangent at the other end. So that's why that's occurring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that arc and I'm going to use my extend uh, snap. So I can just stroke the end of that. It'll bring up, you see when I stroke it again, it disappears. There's a little plus that turns up. If I hover over that for a second, it brings up the, uh, the little plus symbol and I can extend that. Uh, I'm just going to turn off my polar because it's conflicting. And I can extend that um, arc around at the same radius. So I haven't made any changes. I've just extended that around. Uh, and in my snaps, I might just show you what I've got. Yeah, so the ones that I'm using, I turn all of them on, including nearest. Nearest is quite busy and people often turn nearest off. Um, I turn insertion off so I don't accidentally uh, grab uh, the insertion points of surfaces and things like that. But I turn them all on uh, and then what I do, if I'm trying to achieve a snap, uh, I can draft in and then I can just push the tab button and it cycles through my other snaps, the one, only the ones that I've got activated. So I can have them all active and even if I've got nearest on, I can just push tab and get the one that I'm actually chasing. I'm looking for the centre point or the midpoint or whatever. Um, if I've got a circle, it'll give me that option as well. So I can get the centre point in the circle, things like that. So you might want to consider turning your snaps on, um, and you get that uh, you get that extension option. So that's what I just used there to bring that around. So I've, I've given this uh, arc a bit more extension. So I'm going to draw that line again, alpha line. I'm going to type tan uh, and tangent to that arc, and I can type tan again the next arc and that automatically applies a tangent for me so then I can just trim TR for trim and I can choose the line and I can trim those uh, edges off might not be completely obvious they might be very close so just keep in mind that you will have to use the trim tool uh, and I'm deliberately excluding that point so I'm trimming back to my line so this is basically uh, one way where you can maintain tangency and uh, maintain tangency and fill it basically from arc to arc. Uh, there's going to be some issues in here. You may wish, given that all of the points occur on the left here, to add a, uh, an IP or break this line um, before you've done the tangency, of course, uh, and then 
add these lines and then fill out an arc in there. That might be an option. And basically we've maintained tangency drafting the center line. Okay, now I would want to turn that into a polyline, but of course everything's in different Z values. So it's important that we uh, come back through and in our properties, there's gonna be a different start and end. Uh, and so we can just set these all to zero. And the same thing with our arcs. Uh, they'll have a center Z, it goes to zero. Like polylines, uh, these are planar, but they can still have a Z value, so they can be elevated. Uh, so then we can just type polyline. I, I go poly edit straight away, and then ask me, do I want to turn it into one? I say yes, and then I say J for join. Uh, and then I can grab all of the objects. Now you don't have to worry about selecting points or other entities, um, because they, they can't be joined to the polyline, it'll just be excluded. Okay, so now we've got our polyline, uh, and we can then use our alignment tools in uh, AutoCAD, uh, CSD Plus, and BricsCAD builds. You can just use the alignment tab and create an alignment straight from that. Uh, in this instance, I'm in Civil 3D, so I would come to the Home tab, Alignment, and Create from Objects. And I can just grab my alignment and create it this way. So this one would be uh, alignment graphing. Uh, now, I won't add curves. I'm going to talk about these options as well, uh, just a little bit. And optionally erase the existing entities. I personally prefer to uh, not erase them and leave them in. Because I'm using selection cycling, it's, no, it's not a real lot of extra work for me to select uh, the object. Uh, I can always send, um, I can always send the line work. Uh, I've got the multiple selection here. I can always send the polyline to back as well, uh, display order center back. And so that way it won't be um, dominating the view. Uh, if I turn my selection cycling off, typically you'll get uh, the one that's on top first. So you can see um, if I just click the first one I get is my alignment, not the line, polyline underneath. So it can be worthwhile leaving the line work in there. It's also great for recovering uh, if you, for whatever reason your alignment comes in broken or you need to restore it, it's good to have that, um, it's almost like a backup of the line, uh, of the alignment of the, uh, of the actual alignment, small a alignment. So um, that was another uh, thing that was suggested by one of our other, other users. Okay, so there's another way that you can do this, um, which is sort of a cheap and nasty way, um, which I wouldn't recommend, so I'm reluctant to show it, but you can certainly uh, just create the alignment um, from lines and so you can just go uh, polyline and just basically connect all of these together I won't uh, spend our time drafting lines like this but if you had all of the lines or even flattening um, the survey polyline which I'll actually discuss as well um, the way that you can make an alignment from objects I haven't seen this done but it's just an option that I thought I should show uh, what not well what I wouldn't recommend doing you can create an alignment from objects uh, and I'm happy with that if I choose down the bottom here, I can actually add curves between the tangents and that will make tangent, that will force tangency. And I can just put a really small radius in here. I can say like uh, 20 or something in there. Uh, there's nothing to erase, I can have it on. And you can see how it's then created these nice um, 20 meter radii. The thing is like it's blind. So every change in direction, um, because it's imperfect, it will always apply a curve. Uh, to maintain tangency. And so you're going to end up with a scenario with uh, tangents, which are basically lines. And then you're going to end up with, um, and a survey is typically going to be, I'm exaggerating here, but it's in, invariably going to be imperfect. If it was perfectly straight, it'd actually be wrong because the road is imperfect. So uh, it's just, I guess, something you have to accept uh, from a surveyor. That's what you're going to get is uh, imperfect lines, even if they're meant to be straight. That's what you get. And it'll be uh, continually filleted. Um, I'm going to fill it radius uh, 20. It'll be continually filleted like this. And so what you'll get is a nice uh, tangential, you, it'll maintain your tangency, but it's going to be um, odd in, fa in, the, in the sense that you're going to expect a straight line in your design, but each one's going to maintain this crooked behavior, even though it has nice fillets. Uh, and so when you, uh, have these perpendicular sample lines that come off of it. 
what you're expecting to be a straight line is actually going to have all of these uh, crooked um, sampling lines which aren't parallel to each other and perpendicular to what should be a straight centre line. So I'll, I'll discuss that a bit later on as well when we do an example. Uh, and the other thing I want to show you is the flatten tool. So as I, as I come over here, um, we've got our 3D polyline. So I'm just going to grab that space to move um, and then see for copy. So another thing I'm doing here for the newer users is I'm just using the groups to, to do the copy and uh, there's other functionality as well. I might spend a second on that. Uh, if you hover over a group and you grab it, different groups have different controls, but the default option is stretch. Most people will be familiar with that. Uh, if I push space or enter, it cycles through to move. If I push space or enter again, it cycles through to rotate. Next one is scale and the last one is mirror. Probably more for an architect would be useful to have mirror. Uh, and then it goes back to stretch. So you've got some functionality, uh, CAD functionality with your grips, uh, just so you know what I'm doing. Okay, so regarding the flatten command, I've got this 3D polyline, and you can see here it's got the Z values. So as I step through, they're all different. Um, you can select the object and just type flatten as a command. I personally don't like the flatten command because I've, I've had experiences where it seems to translate things across. Um, on a funny angle, uh, so just colour me cautious with uh, flatten. You can certainly use it. I've just used it there, um, and it didn't uh, deviate at all. So I guess most of the time it'll be fine. But just keep an eye on it. I have had experiences where it's moved across. So another way you can do it, um, and another thing you need to do here anyway, is to explode it and turn it into a, a 2D polyline. Even though it's flat, it's still a. It's just a flat version of a of a 3D polyline. So you need to convert it to a 2D polyline. Uh, one way to do that is to just X for explode. It turns it into a whole bunch of lines. Uh, and each of those has a, has a flat Z value. If I didn't type the flatten command, I could still just explode the 3D polyline. Uh, and all of those uh, would then be basically 3D lines. And then I could just, uh, in these properties, I could select all of them. And in the properties, I can come and just set all of their Z values to zero. And then the delta Z would be set to zero. Uh, and then you'd end up with a whole bunch of flat lines as I've got here. And so all I need to do here is just uh, poly edit. Uh, it asks me, oh, I can do fast. so PE for poly edit. Do I want to turn it into one? Yes. Uh, and then my next choice is J for join, and I can just grab everything. Okay, so now we've got a flat uh, 2D poly line down at elevation zero. So when I bring that back in, over here, I can snap to that point again. You see how it's uh, going to the endpoint snap. Um, another suggestion here was to use a, a fixed offset. So if I copy it out, then I copy it out at a fixed offset, offset like 300 meters or something off to the side, and then bring it back 300. So you can use that option. Um, I like to just have things wherever I want them. So I copy it out wherever I want it, and then I can just bring it back. When I place it, you'll see here, as we discussed before, you can see the Z value. Uh, it's still flat, but it's up at that 37 metres. And so I can uh, change that back to zero here. And now it's flat down at level zero. So that's another way how you can uh, create a polyline, uh, which is you know, in 2D and available to be used as uh, an alignment using these sort of 3D alignment creation tools. So I've shown uh, a few best fit options. I've shown the curve options. Now, once you've done that, uh, you can then create your uh, alignment. Now, some people, some users in the past have, have gone, oh, I've got a line down the centre. That's where the surveyor says the centre line is. Um, that's where my alignment should be because that's, a sense, that's as, as good as it gets. Um, what I want to show you uh, is some of the error that that can uh, contribute to. And what I wanted to show you was this little image in here. I've just drafted up a little uh, cross section where if you uh, choose one of these three options where you've got a slight deviation, I'm going to show you. So there's a bit of a deviation here for the, um, the best fit option. Here's my sort of half and half best fit option. Uh, it still has some separation between the points and the center line and even a drafted, uh, you've got more user input here. Uh, and uh, there will invariably be separation between these points. There's going to be some separation. So I guess it's just about just, um, considering managing that separation. Some separation is, in my opinion, acceptable, and that's why I've drafted up this little example. So let's just say that road was a three metre wide, 3% crown 
row here, which I've got here. So let's just say I've got uh, 100 millimeter uh, offset. So the surveyor's um, surveyed point, which shows the crown, and my center line, which I'm drafting in, uh, is let's say 100 millimeters. It's off in this direction, so there's a noticeable offset in the uh, X and Y axes. But if you look at the Z value at a 3% crown, you're only talking about three millimeters in height. Right? So there's not a lot, it is different, but there's not a lot of elevation difference um, when you consider uh, the offset and the impact that's going to have um, with a, uh, I guess a designer's interpretation of the survey, which is what we're talking about. Okay, uh, the other issue, if I use that polyline that I just created and turn that into uh, an alignment, which is in the example here, the alignment I've created here is uh, straight from survey. So this is the one that I've created. I've basically turned it into a 2D polyline, used the, uh, or the civil 3D tools or in uh, AutoCAD and BricsCAD builds, you'll be just using the uh, site design alignment tools, but basically you're creating an alignment from a polyline object, a flat polyline object. Uh, and so you'd be using the create from objects op option. I've already done that. So if this one in the alignment that I'm looking at, uh, another possibility which may occur is that the surveyor picked up the center line of this road at one point and then picked up the center line of this road at another point. And so these lines don't touch. It's very unlikely, well, I, I put it to you that it's mathematically impossible for him to survey exactly the same point the second time around. Um, you can just try and, even on your desk, uh, touch a point, close your eyes, touch the same point. You can't do it. So um, uh, it's it's just not going to happen. So if you're using the surveyed lines as your alignments, um, they won't touch. And anyone who's used uh, civil site design uh, will know that these alignments to create a T intersection, you really want, uh, want those to touch um, and not touch at a node. Uh, there's lots of complications that can come from setting your alignments up wrong. Uh, and so what you want to do is make sure that that alignment goes through and that this one comes through and that they're actually touching. So this is another reason why, or another thing to be aware of, I guess, if you're going to use the surveyor's line as your center line alignment. So I've got that alignment in there now. What I'm going to do in the civil site design tools, I'm just going to turn that into a very quick and nasty road. Okay. So I'm just doing this off screen, let's bring that back in so you can see. So I just turned that into a road with uh, the 10 meter interval. So I'm just gonna grab that, um, you can see here we've got all this extra sampling. Every time that alignment changes direction, there's an extra sampling. So you're getting some bizarre sampling um, unintentionally. And the other thing, I'm just gonna deliberately pull this down, uh, pull that ray down. I'm gonna delete these end ones. So what I wanted to do is create some separation here. And so when I make my road, and it's, you can see when I pan it turns up, I'll have to turn my image to the background. What I wanted to show you here, I've just done that design so there's a large Z value gap and I'll get some large batters. So I close that. I'm just gonna send my image to back so that I can see my objects and RE to region. Now I've got my uh, designing here, you can see the batter string coming out here quite wide as expected. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is turn on in my toggle display options, I can come over to the survey sample lines and uh, I've got straight from survey here. Uh, I just wanted to turn those on. There we go. So you can see how those sample lines that create my road come out perpendicular to, from the centre line. So when they come out, when the center line is slightly crooked, which is invariably going to happen, um, this is quite a subtle deviation. If the surveyor finishes from one uh, setup and then has to set up up the hill, for example, quite uh, common over a crest of a hill, you can't survey through a hill. So you have to set up uh, at one side and possibly set up again on the other side. Uh, and so you'll, you'll find that he has to come back and try and start back where he ended on the last setup. So he'll come back and set up and you might end up with a survey point and then another one nearby. Because they're so close together, he might even paint a mark on the road. Um, because they're so close together, there's usually a little step that steps out. So you can have quite a dramatic um, change in alignment uh, with the points are really close together. And what that results in is these 
sample lines which are perpendicular to the line work crossing over. Um, so I'll just point out, and I've put these little dimensions in for this example. So these two sample lines are 5.9 to 8 metres apart. As I move away though from that centre line, you can see that that um, value on this side decreases and on this side it increases. No big deal, you might think, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with uh, you know a few hundred millimetres, quite a significant change. Um, but if this road has a constant grade and all of these strings that measure from it are also at a constant grade, the footpath through here and then through here, because these points are closer together compared to there and these points are further away compared to there, you're going to get changes in grade in your footpath, which are unintentional. It's going to go up and down and up and down, um, even if your road is perfectly flat. Uh, well, at a flat grade, so not, not, not a flat road, obviously. Uh, and so another way to highlight this is if I add a sampling in here, if I add a sampling along that road, single chainage, um, we're just going to go really close for whatever reason, that's where my drainage is or something, so I click OK on that. You can see here it actually crosses over because they're so close together and you get this effect in here and this is what we call a bow tie. So every time I refer to bow tie, I'm also doing a webinar next week where I'm focusing on bow ties and curvatures. Uh, but this is um, what a bow tie is. It's when the chainage increases, but it actually has to double back on itself as this string goes forwards. Its chainage here is higher, but it's actually further back and then it continues on. So this is uh, the detrimental effect of having, uh, or basically not having a tangent centre line has a knock-on effect out in your design, and this is quite common uh, if users use the survey. So they're going to have this effect out in their projects. Okay, so that's it for sensor lines. I do have some more stuff to show you guys regarding arcs. So if I come over here, um, what I've done here in these two little images is I've basically drawn a circle, and then I've drawn that use the uh, polygon command polygon. Uh, and you choose the number of sides, I'm going to just choose 10 or something, and I choose the center of the circle. Now it gives me this option here, inscribed or circumscribed. So I don't need to do it again, but you can see here this was inscribed and circumscribed. The two different options. And so if I'm making an, a, an arc, specifically, let's just say a curve uh, the the different outcomes are quite uh, dramatically different and have a knock-on effect to the, uh, the vertical grading in the curve as well, which we'll have a look at. So you've got these uh, points which intersect. So if this is your survey in the background, for example, and then you fit an arc, then your levels out here will be out uh, from the relative surveyed surface. Remember the triangulation will be reading from the lines. So that's a triangle that will come from this uh, survey. And so if, as I fit an arc, I'm going to get this deviation that comes out into the road. Conversely, if I do the same behaviour, uh, but this time I insert or I circumscribe uh, the arc. So if I did the arc from a tangent to the, uh, or at a, forming it from the tangent points, as in filleting is the example here. So if, you, if I filleted those lines, then my level is going to be inside the curve. Uh, and so the survey point here is what you guys call the lipper curve. Here in WA, that's uh, more akin to the face of curve. Uh, but the point is that if it branches off in this direction, like if the error that we accept is out in the road, it's going to be less of an effect than if the error was up in the curve. Because the curve levels are, are dramatically different. It goes down for you guys, it goes down for the valley and then up uh, down to the invert and then up to the uh, top of the curve and then up to the back of the curve. Um, for us, our curb jumps up immediately, so this is quite bad. This is pretty much the top of curb level, and this is supposed to be my edge of bitumen uh, level. So there's quite a dramatic level difference. And so um, that's uh, an example of the different, um, I guess, philosophies you can approach your curb returns with. Um, I've got some other examples in here of curb returns. So this is basically the data from this corner here, and all I've done is just grab the points and uh, the line work out from that, so we can have a look at that in isolation. So here's the survey line. It's basically uh, 
as it's drawn, it's in 3D, and I think, uh, you know, just flatten this one out. So it's just a polyline and down at level zero. So you can create an alignment from that. Uh, and as we've spoken about, um, you get some funny behaviors uh, with the uh, bow tie effect, uh, more so with, with curves, because if this had a regular sampling interval of 10 meters or something, uh, this will come out perpendicular to the sample uh, frequency, one meter on a curve probably, something like that. And then this one will come out perpendicular to the sampling and immediately I've got this bow tie effect, both of them perpendicular to the line. Uh, and you're going to end up with this uh, very bizarre spoked wheel uh, behavior where none of them actually indicate the center of the, of, of the, uh, of the curve. Right? It could be one single radius, but you're going to end up with a very complex um, behavior here. So that's one option is just using the survey line. Again, you're going to have some um, bow tie effects. This is the quick and easiest way. Uh, another thing to consider is different codes. So if I look on the aerial photo, which I recommended everyone use, and you can see this one has a footpath that comes through. Um, this one is at, at the back of the curve, so it doesn't really uh, subscribe to my point. But if uh, quite often you have the footpath away from the curve and then it comes and meets the curve with uh, an access ramp or a frame ramp or whatever your phrasing is. So if that happens, and I've just drafted in, and these are the same points, and I've just made up some points here to, to give us that as an example. Um, most commonly with a surveyor, they'll probably do a normal curve with, let's say, five points. Uh, so let's just say one, two, three, four, five, and so you form a, a curve shape with five points. Um, now, this one had some extra points, which I'm going to assume were from the footpath. So you can see here, if this is my curve string, it comes in and then my footpath string comes out here, you'll see that I'll have these levels here, which will be conflicting with the triangulation from the road. So I'm gonna have verge level shots out in the road. So they're gonna end up with some very bizarre uh, lifts up and down. This will be your triangulation from that, from that effect. So you're gonna end up with these uh, lifted shots out here in in the road level, which is uh, very inaccurate. And so you would have to adjust your string to include these points, even though they're not curved shots, you need to consider the fact that they're actually going to cross that brake line. Um, crossing brake lines is also a big no-no for some of the functionality, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. So it's always a good idea if you can try and avoid crossing brake lines. Okay, so that's uh, with different codes. Now, in order to resolve that, um, this option here, I've drawn a polyline and I've just, uh, so I can redo what I did for that. So I'll just delete that one. So for this one, I did polyline and I can just, when it starts to bend, so that's starting to bend there. So I can just go uh, A for arc. And the beauty of this method is that if I just type A for arc, you'll see as I try to draw the arc, it maintains tangency with the lines coming beforehand. So I can click that and it maintains tangency with the arc that I've drawn beforehand. So this is one way, and I can just continually snap uh, onto those points, and it will maintain tangency. So the downside is that at the end, any error, um, and there's going to be subtle errors, both in the actual real-world environment, no curve is, is created perfectly, and then there's also the surveyor's error. So you're going to have tiny errors, at least, um, in the curve created by uh, the surveyor's points. And each error can magnify and, and uh, meander back and forward and then you end up with this scenario where I'm not actually happy with that. Uh, and so, or I could control Z. What I can do is go uh, L for line and start doing lines again and get my line back in here, but clearly I've got uh, a failed tangency here. So there's a challenge here um, by using just the arc command. Uh, and so there's other options here where I just use uh, arc and make three points. Uh, so what I've done in this example is basically this one, um, but instead of snapping onto those, <coughs> I drafted through them and then dragged out the curves. So I did a polyline here. Uh, through there and then uh, A for arc. And so I've just created arcs from my my curve shots and then 
I can drag this across to accommodate for that small error. The problem with this is I've now broken the tangency of the arcs as well. So my where it becomes from arc to tangent or, from, or to line, uh, we don't have tangency. And also from arc to arc, I have also lost tangency. Uh, and that will result in the um, broken spokes as we spoke about before. So in order to avoid, in order to avoid this effect, uh, the solution, one solution would be uh, to basically do the tangents uh, as lines and then just draft them together. So until my, so I've just drafted the lines obviously up here for the straight portions I need to consider uh, the bow tie effects up there. But for a curve return, I've got this line coming in here and I'll just look at these in isolation so I can delete those. So I've got these two tangents coming in and I want to uh, form my arc. So what I can do is just do a fillet uh, and I have a note down here on what I should be using. Fillet of let's say radius seven, which is quite small, uh, but we'll forgive the designer. So seven and just bang that onto that. And uh, the other issue, with filleting, they need to be coplanar, so because these are both lines, you can see by the grips, as I spoke about. And so I just need to set them, start Z0 and Z0, and the delta becomes zero and they're basically flat. So here I can go fill at radius seven, it remembers my last entry, and I can just create a fill it on those. So you can fill at a radius, and, and I guess a bit of trial and error to get that radius um, to be. Uh, the most accurate, and you see in the other examples for center lines how there's a slight deviation which we acknowledge and accept to maintain tangency. In this example, it's we've ignored that and uh, and the consequences that come with that, which we've discussed. If you do that on a curve return, you end up with this spoke behavior and bow ties as well. Uh, and so in this instance, um, there's a slight deviation obviously between my approximated radius and the actual location of the points. So there's uh, a discussion now to be had on what's the consequence of using this method. This, this gets me my tangency. It's uh, nice and clean uh, tangency. I can actually nominate a radius. I like to use whole numbers. I like to actually put R7 on my plan instead of R7.246 or whatever it is. Uh, and so you can actually um, override that with uh, a whole number radius if it fits. Uh, and then it's just about managing this uh, this error. Um, you might be okay with this. This is quite close. This is closer than any of the center line shots. So uh, so let's go with this. The problem is that my alignment, when I turn this into an alignment, is now inside the curve in in places. Okay. So from here, there'll be another offset shot. Let's say um, in this instance it was the ramp. Uh, in this instance it'll be the curve. And as I said in WA, uh, our curves come up immediately, uh, and that's the profile of our curve, roughly. And so it comes up immediately. This is supposed to be vertical, but you can't have a vertical line. So it's ex basically extremely steep. Any offset in this direction results in a, um, in a significant Z value change. And you'll see that in your uh, long section for the curve return. Uh, and so you just need to be mindful that the, the common points, so this point here, if you can extrapolate it out, this point here uh, will be basically this one here is the only accurate point, and this one here, and then it's filleting those two together. But in places, it may slightly cut the corner, and so your um, surveyed surface in the uh, vertical grading won't be a true representation of the actual face of curve. Okay, so you may need to make some adjustments to that. Uh, civil site design automatically applies a, um, a profile to that uh, and as a user I would suggest that um, and you can't just use the drape tools is, as I guess what I'm getting at because the surveyed surface this triangulation will actually be back up in the verge level uh, not so bad for you guys um, this will be an in invert potentially much more significant for WA users so let's just say there was a natural surface shot in here somewhere so that triangulation will will be at a different Z value, which can be quite significant. Um, if this was not a natural surface, this would be a curve shot. It's actually going to be much closer and much more different. Uh, so you're going to have a, an invert level or something in there for us to be top of curve level. 
So it's going to be quite, uh, quite, quite aggressive. So that's, uh, that's the discussion on curves. Uh, and that brings me to the conclusion of today's uh, webinar. JT, have we got any questions or something I can answer for the rest of the, rest uh, of the guys? No specific questions um, that, that certainly are asking about what you're showing. Um, certainly there was some discussion around um, different techniques and whatnot, but um, I suppose the purpose of today is really to focus on um, when you have very limited information <laughs> to get started, to get to get on with your alignments. And I think what you've shown today is a prime example of what, you know, we can very typically show, um, you know, Civil 3D, um, or even civil site design um, with polylines beautifully already created and content already there. But really the process of even getting alignments with um, your projects or obtaining alignments um, can actually be extremely tricky. The amount of projects that I've had where all I've had is 3D points um, and I've had to go ahead and create alignments with absolutely nothing other than points um, mm. it is very typical. And as much as, um, as I said, you can go and maybe request 3D polylines or at least something with some linear data of some sort, it's not necessarily always the case that you're going to be receiving it. Um, Absolutely. Um, and just further to that, um, this alignment is sort of uh, left over from our training. Um, this was obviously a design alignment, so it's not bound by um, site constraints and things like that per se. But uh, yeah, when we train, obviously we've got nice alignments and they all fit together and it's easy. But in a real world environment, um, in this scenario, uh, during road recon and so on. Uh, yeah, so the line work that you're given and the servo points that you're given um, is going to be imperfect. And so, yeah, it's about, uh, I guess, tolerating the that Im imperfection uh, and uh, I guess a few workaround options that you can use, which method you choose to, to minimise that effect, I guess. Yeah, and in respect of method, we have had a question pop in, which is regarding, um, you know, possible drawbacks of different methods and what would potentially be the most accurate way of doing the curve return alignment. Um, and really that comes down to, I guess, Terry, the sort of user decision. Yeah. Um, it is. It's hard to give a, um, an answer because as every user, every designer will know that every location is different. Every curve return is different. The bottom, mm -hmm. like this curve return is different to that one. This one has a full path. Uh, <laughs> this one doesn't. Uh, and it's basically the same road, same intersection. So, uh, the survey data I get might have these two points uh, as being uh, curb shots. Do I want to include um, footpath shots in my curb return? So there's decisions that a user will need to make on the fly. Mm. Uh, and I guess the point of this session was not, I guess, to say this is the correct way, but rather these are the things to consider. Absolutely. Uh, and the issues that other users have had and try and maybe highlight a few of the pitfalls uh, for users before they fall into the same traps as other people. So. Um, it, what is the best way? It really depends on the site. Uh, a greenfield site, and I think this is your earlier point, a greenfield site like this, you're free to, um, other than boundaries really, and if there's significant trees and things to say, uh, but other than those, you know, rather generous options, uh, you can design with impunity. So this road deviates and uh, does what it wants because that's what designer needed it to do. Here in a real world, in a uh, brownfields environment, uh, your, the data that you'll have will be an existing road that you won't necessarily want to uh, reconstruct. And so you'll be widening on an existing road and things like that. Uh, and so you, you do have different um, site constraints. Uh, and so what is the best way? It really depends on the site. So there's not really one answer, one size fits all for that. Yeah. Um, Joseph's asked a very, very interesting question. I don't think, unfortunately, we've got time to answer it um, in respect of creating uh, reverse curves uh, for an alignment. Um, I know that that is something we have covered in the past, but um, Joseph, what we might do is get you to um, just keep an eye on the end slide, and then we can refer you to some documentation regarding that. I don't think we've got time to, to jump into reverse curves or reverse arcs um, uh, specifically within this, uh, this well, we're now over time. So um, good question though, Joseph, and hopefully we can give you some, uh, some, some resources for that. Great stuff. Um, no other questions at the moment. So Terry, what I might do is um, just share my screen so we can um, sign off. Thank you very much. Um, really good grounds, uh, ground up. Um, uh, a webcast to really show you know what happens when you really have not got much to work with um, in respect of um, in respect of start even starting your design um, which is great so what I'll do is I'll just fire up my screen 
uh, screen one, here we go. Uh, Terry, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Fantastic. Um, so look, folks, uh, there is a bit of a, uh, a sequence of events here with respect to our webcasts. Um, you may not have known, but last week, uh, our colleague Todd did a civil 3D alignments, styles and settings. That actually complemented a webcast that he did in, I believe it was July, which was civil 3D template, templates. So there's kind of an ongoing segue here of different um, webcasts that want, sort of semi follow each other. So a lot of what Terry was sort of loosely discussing was because um, Todd has actually covered it previously. Um, any of the Civil 3D related webcasts are all going to be found in this playlist. This is our YouTube channel. So if you haven't been here before, um, we've actually got these into little mini libraries of webcasts. So you can go ahead and find the content that you're asked, uh, looking for. In respect of uh, segues, next week, Terry will be looking at resolving model geometry. So one of the areas that he discussed today was bow ties and then really how model geometry can be rectified if your alignments are as they are, there's nothing you can do. Um, uh, Terry's gonna be covering a whole heap of different things uh, in respect of that. Um, okay, so um, following that in September, we've got a, a bumper um, September for the AutoCAD webcast. Selwyn's gonna be doing a couple, one on parametrics and one on fields based on popular feedback from a poll that we did uh, in July. And we've also got Civil 3D Corridors 101, one that we did in uh, March. And unfortunately, the recording uh, didn't come out, so we weren't able to publish it. So we're going to do that one again. My colleague Shane's going to be doing that. Then Andrew Banson is really going to be giving everyone an update on uh, where Model Viewer is at these days, because uh, a lot of uh, good content goes into Model Viewer. So there's a good chance for us to um, show up on what, uh, what's in there and how you can use it as a design aid, as well as uh, visualization. Um, and if you do have any feedback, so Joseph, this is your, uh, your cue, pop here, there is a, uh, a little form where you can just type in some feedback um, and we can provide you with any resources that you may, uh, may require. And it, again, if you guys have got any feedback regarding this webcast or any webcast that we do or any future webcast that you might like to see, please feel free to go ahead and just pop your details in that form, little message, and we can take your comments on board. Terry, thank you very much again. Excellent webcast. No worries. And, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see many of you next week. Uh, as I said, it, it segues beautifully into uh, resolving model geometry, civil site design. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Thanks guys.